for it, right? Amen. This morning, before we take communion together in the name of Jesus, we want to uh, just look at a passage of Scripture that's very, very familiar. So turn to the book of John, if you have your Bibles, or if you have a Bible app, you can navigate there to the most famous verse, really, that we know, John 3, 16. We're going to look at that verse and the one after it. John 3, 16 and 17. Just begin to unpack an idea here from this text that we could just savor together this morning. You know, today we live in a we live in a really wild, weird, woke, <laughs> wretched world. Yeah, I mean, it, it's mean out there, y'all. People get cruel. I mean, are, are y'all on social media? <laughs> People get cruel, nasty. It can be unforgiving. You know, today, if you did something stupid or said something dumb years ago when you were less enlightened than the culture thinks it is now, and if what you did, that dumb, stupid thing, if, if, if there was a copy of it somewhere, or a picture of it, or an old social media post of something you, you did, if it's still out there on the internet, you know, it can all come back to haunt you now, right? Big time today. It can come crashing in on you like a tidal wave, hitting you where you can get, have you heard this word? You can get canceled. You heard this? Canceled culture. What that means is you can get kicked off social media, get fired from your job, probably get tarred and feathered publicly, the modern version of that. I mean, what I mean is you can lose it all now, right? You can lose it all now for some perceived social crime you might have made long before anybody thought it was even a mistake. And even if you apologize, and I mean apologize and beg Even if you go back and you delete the evidence and you apologize profusely again, it doesn't seem to do you a bit of good. You'll never be trusted again. That's because, as the editors of the New York Post wrote recently, listen to this. Their headline was, No sin is ever forgiven in the brave new woke world. Huh? And then they said this, in this world we've, cre- we've created, in this world we have created, there is no path to forgiveness. There is no redemption. There is only smug dismissal of you. Childhood idiocy, hello, right, makes you an outcast for life now. You've seen it. And the only reason most of us are not victims of it is because we're not that famous. You know, that's so true. We live in a culture where there's no forgiveness and no redemption. And the sins of your youth are remembered now and they are held against you forever. Cancel culture isn't safe for anyone, anywhere. It's cruel, it's graceless, it's a culture where we eat our own. We chew each other up and spit each other out, rejected with no hope of recovery. And the truth is, you feel it all week long. We swim in an ocean of judgment and negative scrutiny, don't we? Yeah, we constantly have to comply with the demands of a very touchy world, and we never measure up. And you've been out there all week, and I have too, in a world where you never measure up. In fact, normal human interactions now are just a big, vicious cycle of criticism and guilt and self-justification. And we're soaked in it every day. And every day we look for relief from it, relief from our own guilt, relief from the fear, and we try to find that relief in any way we can. 
And the truth is, are y'all with me? I mean, we hate this world we're living in, huh? We hate this world we've created. We hate living in it. Because this is a world where no one's pure enough and no one can change. Let me tell you why we're feeling that way. Because everybody, everybody needs forgiveness. Everybody needs forgiveness. And in this world, it's really hard to come by. Forgiveness is our deepest need. And it is, frankly, our deepest longing. I mean, when we finally can clear away the noise of social media and the noise of our lives and the noise of our schedules, down deep below all the noise is this longing for relief, forgiveness. And I'm here to give you some really good news. Two things I want want to say to you today from this text. We'll get to it in just a second. Number one, there is a path to forgiveness. Number one, there is a path to forgiveness. Take hope in that. There is a way to get truly pure and a way you can get truly changed. Okay? But it's found, it's not found in thinking to yourself, well, really, really, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about me. All that I really need to do is just forgive myself. Well, it's really tempting to think. But I'll tell you, just forgiving yourself, it's not good enough. It just doesn't do the job. Because it doesn't go far enough. Because the forgiveness we really need has to come to us from outside of us, not from within us. We need forgiveness from the outside. We need forgiveness from someone who actually has the ability and actually has the authority to pronounce us forgiven for the rest of our lives and for the rest of the universe to fall silent in agreement, no longer judging us. That's what we need where even our own souls and our own consciences finally agree that someone who has the power to forgive us has said so. I mean, wouldn't that be a huge, huge welcome relief to to get forgiven of everything you've ever thought or did? Wouldn't that be a relief? And that all you had to do Just ask? Man. You know, that's what God has been trying to tell us for 2,000 years. That you can be forgiven of everything you've ever thought or did or wanted. And all you got to do is ask. God's been trying to say that to us for 2,000 years. That's, That's the forgiveness that's ready and waiting for us. And it's completely free. Completely free. No cost to you or to me. No hoops to jump through. No payment to make. Nothing to perform whatsoever. Coming to church today doesn't do it for you. Let me tell you how he can make it so free to you and to me like that. Because he sent someone else to make the payment. He sent someone else to take the blame for what you did. For what you thought. All of it. And so this forgiveness that's offered to you and to me, it didn't come cheap. I mean, who needs cheap forgiveness anyway? Why would we want that? The forgiveness that God offers us did not come cheap. It costs a lot to get us out of trouble. I mean, it's wonderfully free for us, but oh, so costly to God. The price he incurred is found in the words of John 3.16. Have you ever noticed this? If you've ever heard this, if you've ever seen this before in your life, these are the most famous words of the Bible, it seems, today. John 3.16. The price is this. Look at it with me. John 3.16 It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Those words are echoed by the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, 32, when he put it slightly different. He put it this way. He said, he did not spare his own son. You know, sometimes we spend money. Back, you remember when we used to use actual money <laughs> and not swipe a card? And we would talk about, oh, yeah, I had some spare change, something we didn't need. First of all, the price that God had to pay was so expensive, there was no spare change left in God's pocket. And yet God did not hold back a single red cent, not a single red drop, if you will. He did not spare his own son. He didn't even hold back his own son. But it says he gave him up for us all. God didn't hold anything back. And God didn't even hesitate to put everything on the line for you and me. He embraced our condition, exposing himself, think about it, to the worst of the worst treatment by sending his own son to die for our sins so that we could be forgiven and live forever. And the high price that God paid in doing that just reveals how bad off we really are. That you and I had to be forgiven to begin with and redeemed in the first place. Some of us think really highly of ourselves. We think we're pretty hot stuff. Huh? We're all this, we're all that. The high price that he had to pay because of what we are and what we've done, how bad off we are, tells you something about us, first of all. It shows how just a bad a shape you and I really are in. And such deep, deep trouble with God for the sins we've done and for the deep, deep bondage to Satan that we've willingly given ourselves to in every choice of sin, everything we've done against God's commands. Listen, the death of God's own son The death of God's own Son shows that our deliverance and our forgiveness from sin and our deliverance from death was a high-cost operation. A high-cost operation. It cost God a lot to get you and me out of the empty, dead-end, hell-bound lives we've been trapped in and to give us a fulfilling future. It costs God way more than what money could buy or gold or silver or diamonds. All the diamonds in the world, under the earth, all the diamonds that have ever been. Listen, it took blood to get us out of the mess we're in. And so God paid for our crimes with the sacred blood of his own son. And God always knew that it would, that's what it would cost him. And do you know he never flinched? He never winced. He never once said, mm, I don't know. This is awfully high price to pay. Maybe I should just forget about them and let them go. Let them all go to hell like the angels that fell. No salvation for them. God didn't have to save us. God didn't have to take care of our sins. He didn't have to do anything. But he did. And he never flinched. He never thought twice. He never deliberated in his mind one way or the other because because unlike, unlike this condemned and very condemning culture that we live in, Do you know that God knows more than the culture knows about us and more than people on social media know about us? God knows everything about us and he loves us anyway. He loves us. That's completely the opposite reaction the rest of the world has toward us when they know what we think and feel and do. 
I mean, we're, we're thrown to the dogs now if you just disagree about something as, as eternally inconsequential as your politics. If you just have a disagreement, now you're thrown to the dogs. But God knows more than that. He knows the real crimes we've done, and he loves us. That's his reaction. Listen to it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But verse 17 says more. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn you and me. He didn't do it for that reason. He didn't send Jesus here to to crash judgment in on our heads. Why? Because we're condemned already. He says he sent his son that in order in order that the world might be saved through him. And think about this. That even though our childhood idiocy And our sins today, whatever the culture is calling our sins, can get us outcast for life with no hope of forgiveness and no hope of redemption, that in God's plan, it worked very differently. That whatever you had done that would cause you to be cast away from God forever, instead of God casting you away, he cast someone else away on your behalf. Do you know that Jesus was was even willing to be totally condemned and outcast for us? Isaiah 53 says, he was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows. What a title. What what a description of his life. A man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. And then it says this. We turned our backs on him. Ah, uh, yes, we're, we're the can- culture canceling him. See, we, we looked the other way. We were too embarrassed of him. He was despised, and we did not care. We canceled him. And why was he willing to let that happen to him? Well, For the love of you. Surely he took our pain. It didn't just get placed on him. He took our pain, Isaiah says. He bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God. Oh, look at him. God's really judging him. He must be some kind of bad guy. No, 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 no. All all of your bad was on him. That's what was going on. Stricken by God and afflicted. But he was pierced. Five bleeding wounds he bears, received on Calvary. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was laid on him. Which brings me to the second thing I want you to see this morning. That Jesus died to cancel your sins, not you. In other words, Jesus now stands in our place and he takes all the finger pointing at you for what you've done and he points all the fingers at him. Points them all at himself. And he says to God, God, and he says to the devil, and he says to the rest of the world, and he says to you and to me, he says, look away, look away from you. Look away from them and what they've done and look at me instead. I'll take the full blame. I'll take the punishment so that they get off free and clear. So you did the crime and he gets the punishment. And Jesus always knew from the beginning he was going to do this for us. This was no surprise to him in his life. And you know, he never shied away from it. He never shied away from us making him look bad. I mean, bad's not even the word for it. You know what else is true? You know, God's never been waiting for us to get our act together. Never. Never. Do you know that God always makes the first move? And he did make the first move. God did what it took 
to rid us of our disgrace and to clear our name totally. And it's all made possible because God generously sacrificed His Son for us. And then after being sacrificed for us on the cross, after being dead, three days dead, it was early on a Sunday morning, like this one, in the spring when Jesus came back alive. And he walked out of that tomb that had been chiseled into the rock. He walked out of the tomb free and clear of the grip of death. He broke it. He rendered death impotent successfully triumphing over what triumphs over you and I and what triumphs over everyone who ever lived. He triumphed over death in order to deliver us from death too. Listen, folks, do you realize this was a massive, mighty miracle? And much, much more than a miracle because by that miracle of the resurrection, God was accomplishing something much, much deeper than just a miracle. He was accomplishing something far more monumental than merely the reclaimed life of a unique man in the Middle East. God was in that act of raising Jesus from the dead, God was orchestrating something bigger for us in that moment. For you, for me, who are here today, Tired of the mess that we're living in. Tired of the mess we've put ourselves in. Tired of the mess of our own lives. God was doing something for us. Those of us who are longing for something more. Something more than just making a living every day. Something more than just another game and another day and another meal, something more than just getting by and being afraid of this world and being afraid of death. He was orchestrating something far, far more, something real, something that lasts, something that not even death can wipe out or make pointless. I mean, God knows the mess we're in. And he knows, he knows that it's far worse than we think it is. And before we even knew what we needed, God had already done what was needed. And so in unflinching love, God sent his very own son, Jesus Christ, to deliver us and to give us the gift that lasts forever. Listen, that's, that is the single basis that you and I have for any hope for a forgiven future with God. That's our only hope. That on the cross, killed like a lamb, a lamb led to the slaughterhouse, Jesus Christ embraced death and embraced our sins, taking it into himself, swallowing it up until death was dead. The death of Christ was the death of death. And then he turned everything on its head. He broke free from death. He's the only man to have gone through death and come out the other side and come back on his own power without having to have someone else raise him from the dead. God the Father in power through the Holy Spirit caused him to break free from death. And he came back alive and well. Pulsing with life, pulsing with power. And in coming back to life, he attained what for us was totally unattainable, totally out of reach. He destroyed the devil's hold on death. And he destroyed death's hold on us. That's powerful. Jesus rose again to free all of those who are scared to death of death. That's the amazing achievement of Jesus' resurrection. That's the gift of eternal life. Listen, not just the gift of eternal youth. Who needs that? you got eternal life waiting for you, man. And so because of all that, all that, the death, the suffering, the embracing of sin, the resurrection, instead of God canceling you, 
God cancels your sins instead. Isn't that good news? And he forever cancels the consequences of your sins that you and I rightly earned. He deleted everything you said. Think about it. He erases everything you did. And it's irretrievable. There's no, there's no God going back and finding it on the hard drive. Huh? It's not on the internet anywhere. God says, I will take your sins and separate them as far as the east is from the west from you. That's infinite, by the way. It's irretrievable. So what that means is that when you trust in Jesus Christ, all the dirt on you can't and won't ever be dug up on you to ever be used against you again, ever. Period. Really? God said so. But more than that, not only is all of that erased, it's replaced. And what God does is he gives you something new in the place of the old, something pure in place of the evil, something as good as God himself. Imagine that. God says that when we put our trust in his son, that God himself gives us Jesus' own righteousness. And that means that then God considers us to be as righteous as Jesus. Wrap your head around that. Huh? Whoa. How do you like to be considered as good and holy and righteous as God? Well, that's the gift that's waiting for you when you turn away from your sins and you're wandering and you're ignoring God and you entrust yourself to Jesus Christ devoted to him as his disciple. Do you see, when I look outside of myself and look to Jesus Christ to take away my sins and give me God's own righteousness, no matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing, And no matter what I'm feeling, God can no longer say of me, he lacks my righteousness. So when you look outside yourself to Jesus Christ, you'll see that it's not your good heart and it's not your good behavior that makes your righteousness any better. And it's not your bad heart or your bad behavior that makes your righteousness any less. You don't make it better, and you don't make it worse. Because if your righteousness is in Jesus Christ himself, then your righteousness is Jesus Christ himself. The same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when you see that as a gift waiting for you by faith, if if you believe that, Listen, your chains will fall off, man. And you will leave rejoicing. When it is Christ, nothing but Christ before your eyes, nothing but Christ that you trust, when it is Christ that is your life, you will finally have peace. The sweetest peace you've ever known. Huh. Listen. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. You know what that means? He's not recruiting winners. He's not recruiting the people who have it all together. The people who've been on good behavior. No, no, no. His heart is drawn toward those who know they have nothing but need And have nothing but regret and guilt. He's drawn to those whose hearts have disappointment and bewilderment and fear and shame. And they feel stuck there.
heard the, one of the best definitions of being stuck I've ever heard this past week. The songwriter said, Every road I ever went down took me to where I didn't want to be. I was stuck. And that is a description of our lives until God rescues us by grace alone. God draws near to those who know they're stuck in their guilt and their regret and their, and their fear and their shame. When you feel stuck, that's where he is near. And so may the Lord Jesus Christ be yours today. Will you trust him? Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you that from before the foundation of the world, this was your plan. You knew about our sins before we ever committed them. You knew about us before we were ever born. You're the one who caused us to be. And for all these years, Lord, you have waited patiently for us to come to you. To trust you. To lay ourselves before you. To come and get our sins rolled off of our backs and onto Christ's who bore them at the cross. And to invite your spirit to come in and make us alive from the dead like Jesus was on the third day. So that's what I ask for now, God. That you would work in the hearts of every one of us here today. Awaken us to this glorious truth. This grace that's waiting for us. By your love, draw us near. I pray you to break the hearts of the hard. And open the eyes of the blind. And the ears of the deaf. That you would melt what is cold and fan into flame desire for Christ to receive from him all that he offers to enter into the finished work that he accomplished for us and quit trying to earn it on our own by our own good behavior and our own good works or just by ignoring you God I pray to forgive us for all the times we ignore you and push you to the side of our lives until some weekend it feels convenient So I pray that today, Lord, you would arrest our hearts with the beautiful, happy news that you so loved the world that you gave your only son for us. If we simply believe in you, we'll not die forever, but be reconciled to you forever. Father, I pray that as we prepare to take the supper together, this Lord's Supper, that you would soften our hearts. Help us to come today not bringing you anything, not even thinking we're righteous enough to partake, but bringing you our sins, confessing them, and coming to the table of the King like beggars, hungry and desperate. Or draw near to the brokenhearted today, I ask. In Jesus' name. Amen.